the Son, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Make us worthy, O Lord, say thank thee, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. How is everyone? Christ is risen. Christos Anist. Anistos Anist. Everybody is muted? Yes, sir. Okay. Let us uh, go and uh, begin the letter to the Romans. This should be a, a very rich chapter. And I'm going to the word. You might have the uh, document sent to you as a PDF. I'm going to use the, the document as Word just in case we need to um, edit anything. So this is an overview of the letter to the Romans. And I think it is important that we take that one letter in one chapter. And basically, it is the theology, the ideas, and the thought of St. Paul, what he was preaching and what he was fighting against and what reasoning he had. He uses heavily um, logic and also the Old Testament. So let's see what, what he's doing in this letter and what ideas he's bringing in, in his <clears throat> gospel. The gospel of Paul, they call the letter to the Romans. We have six inquiry questions. First one, how does the letter to the Romans explain the righteousness of God? We talked about this last time when we introduced the letter. Now talk about it again because it's the beginning of the letter. It talks about the righteousness of God. In the letter to the Romans, St. Paul contrasts concepts. And we have many examples. I'm going to tell you about those duels. There's uh, always these uh, duels that he speaks about. Um, how the Jews and the Gentiles both needed the righteousness of God. In the letter to the Romans, how the righteousness of God is revealed. How is it revealed? And there is a question about Israel. What about Israel? What happened to them? In the letter to the Romans, how the righteousness of God is lived out, how it is practiced. So start with the first inquiry question. How does the letter to the Romans explain the righteousness of God? We talked about it last time in details. I'm going to talk about it briefly again. In this chapter, the righteousness of God is a theological term. It appears in the Gospels as well as in St. Paul's other letters. It talks about it a lot. The beginning of the public service of the Lord in Christ's mission in the Gospel of St. Matthew, he commanded, he commanded people, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the first thing people should seek. And all these things shall be added to you. Might not very easy be very easily recognized. What does that mean? The, the righteousness of God. And this verse we have from St. Matthew's Gospel, I think chapter 6, verse 33, the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the Sermon on the Mount. The righteousness of God marks the kingdom of God and inaugurates it. It marks the kingdom. That's a mark of the kingdom. Where the kingdom of God is, there will be the righteousness of God. And it's the beginning of the kingdom of God. St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, and I think it is Romans 14, 17. He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And this righteousness is described as what the kingdom is. The righteousness of God is called also by St. Paul and other apostles, justification. What you hear about what is justification? It is the righteousness of God. So uh, to be righteous in the sight of God is to be blameless. Is to be justified means God doesn't see any blame on you. 
um, the, in, in God's eyes, you don't have anything to be blamed for. You're in good sight. You're in good uh, stand with God. This is a big issue in St. Paul letters because of the controversy of the Judaizers. St. Paul emphasized the justification by faith against the works of the law. What are the works of the law? They are the ceremonial rituals that define the Israelites as Israelites. They had to be circumcised. They have to go through purification. They had to keep certain feasts. They have to keep certain times. Don't touch. Don't taste. So it begins with circumcision and the different ceremonial observations. So do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. On the other hand, St. James and his letter emphasize the need for the works of faith. St. Paul speaks of works of faith. So that's why we talked last time about uh, four types of works, works of the law, the ceremonial works, including the circumcision. Uh, we had works of faith that includes all the activity that we do um, uh, out of our faith, including the mysteries of the church, baptism, communion, chrismation, confession, includes prayer. These are all works of faith. It includes hoping and waiting for the resurrection and eternal life including repenting, including acts of service. There is a quote from Habakkuk that permeates the letters of the apostles, including St. Paul. And that quote is, the just shall live by faith. That's a quote from Habakkuk. And uh, it was quoted in three of the New Testament letters, including the Romans. So you go to the, to the thing is, uh, it is Habakkuk 2.4. And it's Roman 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. Three, four times in the Bible, this verse is repeated. They say, and I think it is the Old Testament teachers, they say that this is the summary of the whole Old Testament. The just, here justification, just, righteous, shall live by faith. So he's citing it to say, here you go, that is your justification. Life of faith is your justification. So St. James and St. Paul would say, works of faith is a proof of justification that person is justified by. That includes baptism, um, uh, chrismation, communion. These are all works of faith. In contrast to works of the law, which is circumcision, they're more complicated, more uh, difficult, and they have uh, uh, orders to be done in certain sequence and time. So for example, circumcision has to be done on the eighth day, um, the feasts of certain feasts in three times a year has to be done in a certain way. People has to appear in Jerusalem, etc., etc., etc. Now, this is the first one. So righteousness of God, and we're going to talk about it even more. We're going to continue talking about it because this is the main subject of the letter to the Romans. Um, next is the duels. Uh, there is duels, which means terminologies that that work in couples um so there are some of them that actually works together and some of them con conflict works against each other so st paul sees two groups of duels and one group where the the duel actually helps each other when i say dual it means two concepts so i'll give you examples um law law, law and grace Faith and work, these are duels. Uh, Jews and Gentiles, nature and grace, spirit and body, these are duels also. Righteousness versus unrighteousness, that's the other side of the duels, those that fight each other. So let's talk about the duels that actually uh, synergize, cooperate. When you read commentators of commentators of the New Testament, the, the recent commentators, not the fathers of the church, you would read uh, more about duels that actually uh, conflict, more about duels that cooperate. So they turn everything into a conflict rather than into everything. Some of it is conflict. Some of it is uh, cooperate. So let's start with how the church sees the duels in St. Paul letters. First, the group that cooperates are much more. And they are includes faith and work. The church doesn't see anything um, conflicting between faith and work. In fact, living faith has to show work, like St. James said. Law and grace. 
Actually, by grace, we fulfill the law. We don't see conflict between law and grace. Are we not required as Christians to uh, honor parents and not steal and not commit adultery? Of course we are. But then we have grace to help us fulfill the law. There is no conflict here about the law of the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments and grace. Judgment and salvation of God. It's God, it's God who judges and he's going to continue to judge and who also saves. So there's no contradiction between those. To, to escape from judgment, we have to be saved by God. The old and the new, there's no conflict between the two. The new actually fulfills the old and the old predicts the new. Jews and Gentiles in Christ, they become one church. Nature and grace. Grace comes to help our nature and by adding the divine nature. We become partaker of divine nature so that upgrades our nature to become a partaker of the divine nature. Spirit and body. There is no conflict between the spirit and body in Christ. The body is sub subdued to the spirit and the body becomes helper of the spirit in serving and doing the acts of righteousness. We serve with our body. We worship with our body. We fast. We stand. We kneel. And the spirit is soaring in the worship and the service. Reality and symbol. There are two sides of one coin. God's faithful and, and human faithfulness, both, of course, God's faithfulness is absolute, human faithfulness is relative, but we need our faithfulness to follow Christ. We cannot be unfaithful. That's why God sends his spirit to help our weakness to be faithful to him. Church and state, there's no conflict between the church and state. Now we, got, we go into the ones that has a conflict, the dual concept where opposition exists. They are fewer and more fundamental. For example, righteousness versus unrighteousness. There is no mixing here. There is no cooperation. There is definitely two opposite directions. We, we're going to talk about what are the works of righteousness and what are the works of unrighteousness. St. Paul is going to start by talking about unrighteousness first. Faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. Here we're not talking about human faithfulness and divine faithfulness. We're, going to, we're talking about faithfulness to be faithful to God. And to be unfaithful is to break covenant. Good versus, e versus evil. That they don't really go together. There is no cooperation. This is like light, light and darkness. You cannot exist together. Living faith versus dead faith. Living works versus dead works. Natural versus unnatural. Here is not supernatural. Unnatural means something very bad. So we're going we're gonna to see that also in St. Paul writing. He speaks about the unnatural uh, against the natural. So these are the duos. We call them dichotomies, splits, where St. Paul is actually bringing in every chapter of his letter. You're going to see them over and over again. He's bringing his teaching and contrasting and comparison, com contrasting and comparing the duos, things against each other. Let's begin the letter from chapter one to four, we're going to talk about um, the righteousness of God as a concept. He's teaching the principle. What is the, con the righteousness of God? Where do we begin to talk about the righteousness of God? Again, like I said, we talked about the righteousness of God again in the, in the introduction. We talked about it in the beginning of this chapter. Let's talk about it from the point of view of judgment. St. Paul addressing the two parties. We said that the letter to the Romans was about two groups. Both of them are Christian in the church, a group that is from a Jewish background and a group from a Gentile background. These are the two parties and the first duel in the letter. He's pointing out that both before Christ were under the judgment of God against all, quote unquote, acts of unrighteousness. We, we begin with the first uh, dual Jews and Gentiles, and we move into the second, which is acts of unrighteousness. He's saying both Jews and Gentiles were living and, and doing the acts or acting the acts of unrighteousness. They're doing it. And God's wrath is declared against all, all the unrighteousness, all the lawlessness. That's another word for unrighteousness. And he's listing. Let us see how many things he lists under the unrighteousness. 23. 23 items and describing what is unrighteous so he's listing them by name sexual immorality but again 
people sometimes think sexual immorality is the offense that is above all offenses. No, it's not alone. There is a lot of other things. He lists 22 more. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness. What's covetousness? It's desire, to desire something you don't need. Very bad, God forbid. And anybody would go into this. That leads to envy and, and jealousy and all kinds of things. Maliciousness is that evil intentions, to have evil intentions, to wait, to, to do harm, to be malicious, something like um, malice. That's malice where malice comes from is the intention to do evil. Full of envy, which results from covetousness. Murder, strife. What's strife? Somebody who is always fighting always on the look for a fight. They, they, they cannot live without having a strife, uh, a controversy with somebody. They, they want to do this. They want to prove themselves right in all situations. And they would shout and yell and even hurt and hit. Deceit. To, to, be, to de deceive somebody is to act guile, means cheat, trick, to, to act like a, with a trick to lead people, to mislead people, to think you want them good, but you actually are taking advantage of them. God forbid that someone would do this. Evil-mindedness, always thinking evil, and they expect nothing good from people, and they don't expect anything from good from themselves. Whisperer, whisperers here means to gossip. That's unrighteous. Backbiters means to slander, to speak evil of somebody behind their back. That's backbiting. Haters of God, they don't think good of God. Violent, always, uh, you, we hear it a lot in, in the people when they speak, especially our kids, God forbid, when they pick up a language of uh, violent language. They speak like a gangster or somebody who's a street person. Proud, they can't have anybody win. They have to always win. They have to always be the best. Uh, they have to have the best house, the best car, the best dress, the best suit, the best business, the best uh, looks, uh, the best in everything. Uh, it could be their kids, their parents, their family. They are proud of something. Boasters, they're not only proud in their heart, they actually talk about it also. Inventors of evil things. They come up with new things that is evil. People had not done it before. Disobedient to parents. Oh, boy. So he's actually listing this as unrighteous, of course. Anything that breaks the commandment of God is unrighteous. And this undiscerning, meaning not interested to understand good from evil. They don't want to distinguish if it's something is good or bad. They're not interested in that. They, they are more interested in pleasing themselves. Untrustworthy. You cannot trust them with anything. Unloving. They only love themselves. Unforgiving. They never accept apology unmerciful they don't have compassion to be uh i would add here pleased to be pleased with acts of unrighteousness not only those who does the 22 but there is a new category here who is happy with the ones who do who's doing any of the 22 previously they don't have to do it they just have to be happy pleased okay comfortable with things like that they are okay with it. They actually feel good about it. So any person who feels my friend is proud, and I like that a lot. He is proud. Uh, look at him. He's strong or she's strong. Oh, my friend is strong and he beats everybody. I'm excited about it. Oh, my best friend is a gossiper, but she gives me all the good news and the bad news about others. And I like that a lot. These are called pleased with acts of unrighteousness. So what is this list St. Paul is giving us? In Romans, it's actually, and he's bringing this in the first chapter, Romans 29 to 31. What, is, what are these things of unrighteousness? It's saying here, actually, these are what call on the wrath of God, gets the anger of God. This is what would make God angry. So the wrath of God is, is declared against all that. Not against the humans. He loves his, his humans, but the activity itself is bringing on wrath. God hates all these things. He hates it. So imagine a person who insists on doing these things until they die. What would happen? They end up under the wrath of God. So this is the first piece.
God forbid that anybody dies doing these things. So he's going to talk about the Gentiles and the Jews with these things. The Gentiles who did not have the law of God end up practicing the 23 items, the unrighteousness, and were perishing without the law. They were being under severe punishment. They die in sin. But guess, oh, guess what? The Jews also had the law, broke the law, broke, broke the law, and they were judged by it. They were judged by the law that they break. So these are breaking the law, all of it. So some of the Gentiles didn't know the law, so they were breaking it not knowing. And some knew the law because they had it, the Jews, but they also broke it because they couldn't do what the law said to do. So it's almost like this. You have a person who comes from another country, let's say in Egypt, where there is no speed limit. Nobody cares about speed limits in Egypt. And they come here and then they drive a car as a tourist. And they, they practice the same lawless idea of not the speed limiting. And then the police comes and say, you, you, you know that you uh, are, were speeding and I'm going to have to give you a ticket. Said the uh, officer, I am sorry. I, 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 didn't, I don't know that there is a speed limit. And he says, would the, the officer kind of forgive them because they don't know that there is a speed limit? He would tell the person, don't drive. If you don't know the speed law, don't drive. But once you start driving, they're going to have to have a ticket. And someone else who knows the speed law and he knows the speed limit, but they are breaking the speed limit intentionally, both of them will end up in the same place. So what St. Paul is saying, the Gentiles who didn't have the law of God, who didn't got instructed about what's good and what's, what's righteous and what's unrighteous, and they are breaking the law, they will be judged by the law. And the, the, I'm sorry, the Gentiles who didn't have the law will perish, will be punished. They will have to, they will face certain things, not because God wants to punish anybody, but because this is what is against life. It's almost like natural law. You, you break um, the law of gravity, the law of gravity will break you, God forbid. Somebody who says, I don't care about the law of gravity, and they throw themselves from a 10-story tower, they will be broken, not even if they are not dead. So someone who knows the law of gravity, but they, they break it intentionally, they will be broken. But also somebody like a child who doesn't know the law of gravity, and they go to a balcony or something, and they uh, don't know what they're doing and they step out of the balcony, what happens? Both persons who knew and didn't know will be broken. That's what this is about. The end result of the Gentiles not keeping God in their knowledge, in addition to being punished and perishing, was to be delivered to vile passions. This is extra. This is a little bit extra for the Gentiles. What happens when the Gentiles didn't want to keep God? They don't seek God. They don't know him. They end up in engaging on, in homosexual activities. And I here um, wanted to say that's what St. Paul intended. It's, it talks about the activity of sexual acts between the same gender. This is his saying. This is part of the sinful thing. But it's actually at the, uh, as a result, as a fruit of not keeping God in, in a society knowledge. Not individuals. Let's just be careful about this. In the whole letter, we're going to talk about the difference between individuals and the group. When a society, when a culture, does not keep God in their knowledge. They take God out of their everyday life. They end up uh, having the sicknesses, the homosexual activities in their midst and becomes very uh, big. It, it increases. The Jews who judged the Gentiles for breaking the law, they themselves were doing the same thing. They were hypocrites. The law of God is good, but the Jews were not keeping it. The conclusion is, what St. Paul is going to say, both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles, that they are all under sin. That's the conclusion. Making this point clear by quoting the Old Testament, there is none righteous. No, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. He's confirming it by repeating it again that there is not a single person who had been able to keep the law of God, whether they know it or they don't know it, whether Jews or Gentiles. God planned to save all through faith and not the works of the law of Moses. Righteousness, he says, okay, so everybody now is doing unrighteous. The only way to save them is to do my work. They cannot be righteous on their own. I have to give them my righteousness. So righteousness through faith, and we're going to have to speak about uh, details about that. So it's going to unfold. 
without the need for the works of the law was offered to both Jews and Gentiles, but to Jews first, then to Gentiles. Why I say that? Because in every city, the apostles would have to go first to the Jewish synagogue and then come out of the Jewish synagogue and go to the market. They have to always speak to the Jews first. St. Paul used the Abrahamic example of righteousness as the model for the saving grace that God sends to his church in the New Testament. What did he say? He said, Abraham believed God, was accounted to him for righteousness. That's for Abraham. St. Paul makes a point that this accounting of righteousness, reckoning of righteousness, was before Abraham was circumcised. He quotes the psalm, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. To convey the same fact, circumcision was a seal of the righteousness of faith. God imputed righteousness to Abraham at age 90. Abraham was 90 years old in chapter 15 in Genesis. Before he told him to do circumcision uh, when he was 99 in chapter 17. Making Abraham the father of all who trust God God's promises, both the circumcised and the circum uncircumcised. Because what's he saying? When God made the promise to Abraham, I'll make you the father of generations, the, the, many descendants will come out of you. I'll give you a, the promised land. I'll make you a, a blessing to the whole world. And Abraham believed God by looking at the stars in chapter 15, and his heart was calmed and comforted. And it's said there that God accounted this for him, reckoned it, uh, imputed it as righteousness. In God's sight, Abraham was blameless, different than anybody else on earth because he trusted God. Then <clears throat> later on in chapter 17, he asked him to do the circumcision. Okay, so this is makes Abraham receive the righteousness of God or the declaration of the righteousness of God before he was circumcised. Then St. Paul says, in that case, Abraham is a father of both circumcised and uncircumcised, both of them if they believe. Now, the second point. So if we make that point that Abraham was righteous before he was circumcised, but the circumcision was a sign. This is the person in the circumcision. God is saying, this is the family that trusted me. This is the family that trusted me. And for this reason, I give them the sign of circumcision. It becomes a sign of faithfulness, of trust. A beautiful sign in the flesh of Abraham to say that this person believed God and trusted him. Now we go to the next item. The righteousness of God is revealed in the death and resurrection of, and resurrection of Christ. That's the revelation of God's righteousness, truly. St. Paul transferred the example of Abraham to us in the New Testament. What's he saying at the end of chapter five? Now it was not written for his sake alone, Abraham, but it was imputed to him, but also for us, for us, the New Testament. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So what's he saying? He's saying the new thing that God is doing in the New Testament is a promise. There is a promise here, which is beautiful promise that he wanted us to believe. What is the promise? He says, God says, I love you. I, I love you a lot. And that I will give you my son to be the, the way to forgive your sins. But not also that, but, but not only that, but also to give you eternal life. So that I will forgive you and I will give you eternal life. That's what God is saying to us. If we believe this, what should we do? So in chapter five, we have a new invitation to believe and receive the righteousness of God, to believe and confess the death, to believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. That's what the mother does in baptism or anybody who comes to baptism. They stand before the water of baptism and say, I believe in the death. And we say it in the liturgy. Amin, 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 your death, O oh Lord, we confess. I'm sorry. We proclaim your holy resurrection and ascension into the heavens we confess so we believe in the death and we confess in the death and resurrection and we confess both of them with our mouth so the invitation to believe and receive the righteousness of god to believe and confess the death 
and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But God, what St. Paul is saying, demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Something unbelievable, that God looks at sinners, loves them so much, that he sends his only son, the one he loves the most, that he said about him in baptism, you are my beloved son. <clears throat> you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that one son that God is pleased in is given as reconciliation for us. So demonstrate his own love toward us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It is the good news of the new covenant that had to be believed with the heart, confessed with the mouth to receive the righteousness of God. Here I want to stop in chapter 5. There's a verse here. St. Paul here speaks about how did sin come to the world? There is verses here in Romans 5 that says, Therefore, just as through one man, he's talking about Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. It's, it's understood in different ways. This verse is understood in different ways. St. Augustine, and after him, the, the Catholic Roman Catholic Church and our church, the Coptic Church, hold that humanity in Adam sinned. While Eastern Orthodox Church, and you find that in the Orthodox Study Bible too, when you come to this verse, they will strongly defend that we inherited not the original sin, we inherited the consequences. They have a point, and we do have a point, of course, but there's much more to our point than theirs. While the Eastern Orthodox hold the doctrine of inheriting the consequences of original sin, but not the guilt of the original sin, we say we are responsible. And how I know this? Because in our liturgy, we say this. Uh, you formed us, created us, and placed us in the paradise of joy. When we have disobeyed your commandment, we, that means the church, disobeyed your commandments through the deceit of the serpent we fell from eternal life so we talk we talk we take responsibility might not be guilt i would say that's a little bit far but i would say at least responsibility as humans we in adam took a decision in adam to disobey god it's not my personal um, sin but in adam we all sinned so what St. Paul is saying here, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So there is sin that entered the world and death. So both of them entered the world. But then he's saying all sin. Uh, they say, oh, all sin because of death. When death came to the world, then people under death became liable to sin. And in any case, and this is a controversy that is not resolved, and we have it till today because of this verse in Romans 5. And it's Romans 5, uh, 12 and 13. So if you see it, understood, understand this is uh, one of the controversies between us and the Eastern Orthodox Church. But in this, we, we are on the side of the St. Augustine and the Catholic Church. The revelation of God's righteousness. Now, now, now we, we, we believed that Jesus died for our sins. That's what we say. We proclaim his death because he died for our sins. And he's raised from the dead. We believe in those two items. What happens next? In the time of Abraham, when, God, when Abraham believed in that God will fulfill his promise, God said it to him in words. You are righteous before my eyes. You are righteous, he said. But let's see what God would do in the New Testament. After explaining the good news of God's new covenant that had to be believed and to be confessed, St. Paul continued to explain how the righteousness of God is not just, not just imputed to us as legal declaration. It's not saying. God never just speaks words. In the Old Testament, maybe, but it was not the, the full thing. But given to us in the gifts of God's Son and His Spirit. So the righteousness of God is nothing less than His Son and the Spirit. That is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is to put on Christ in baptism, 
and to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit in Holy Mayroon. That's what will make us truly just and righteous, to be saints. So in baptism, we are buried and resurrected with the Son. And in Holy Mayroon, we have the Spirit indwelling us. This is what St. Paul is doing in chapter 6, 7, and 8. That's interesting because that's how the letter goes on. It talks about unrighteousness in chapter 1 to 4 and uh, 1 to 3. And in and unrighteousness and listed and said that both Jews and Gentiles are falling into the same trap. And in the need all, they are falling short of the righteousness of God. So what's the righteousness of God is revealed in the death and resurrection of Christ that it has to be believed and accepted. And then based on that, we are given the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is not less than his son and the spirit. So by baptism, we are freed through the son and the spirit. We are transformed to a new life, the life of God. That's the righteousness of God. Not just legal declaration, because that's, I think, most of the Protestant denomination would say, once you confess the, the Christ is Lord and you say, I believe in his cross and resurrection, you are saved by your declaration. So it becomes a legal declaration, words. In the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, it's not only that. In baptism and in Myron, we are given the life of God in his Son and the Spirit. That's a huge difference. In the Protestant world, that's why they, they end up by saying, confess the Lord with your mouth. Come and confess Jesus as your Savior. And that's it. You're done. And we say, no, you're not done. You're not really, you didn't receive anything yet. You didn't receive you. Maybe your sins are forgiven, but you had not received the righteousness of God yet because the righteousness of God is a living, a living being born again from heaven. And how is that going to be unless you put on Christ and the spirit? So by baptism, we are freed from the slavery to sin and death to the freedom of the children of God. In baptism, we studied it in, lit in liturgical. We said, you become a child of God, you become one with Christ, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit, you become a member of that church, you, can, you become a priest, prophet, and king. To be a slave to God is to have fruit of holiness, and the end is everlasting life. The wording of Romans 6 implies synergistic work between the Holy Trinity and the believers. The Trinity works with us, and we have to work with them. God defeated sin and death in his Son. And requires of us to consider ourselves dead to sin as well. Sin cannot overcome the baptized. The baptized has to allow sin to reign in his or her body. If, if they go back to slavery of sin to sin, they have to let sin have, do this. In the Old Testament, before Christ came and we were baptized, sin dominated. Nobody could fight sin. But in the New Testament, there is actually a power to fight sin. In chapter 7, St. Paul described the, described the inability of the law to save humans from sin. He introduces the law of the spirit as a new internal power against sin and death. When, when you have Jesus lives on us and the spirit lives on us, this is a power that actually fight against sin and death. The Holy Spirit received in Myron leads the baptized to put the passions to death. That one thing that does, two things the spirit does in us, first of all, fights the passions. What are the passions? Anger, lust, gluttony, uh, uh, jealousy, all, all these things, covetousness, all the unrighteousness that is spoken about in the beginning. The Spirit fights it in us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Not only does the Spirit help me put the passions to death, but also calls through me, the Spirit prays in me, Abba, Father. The Spirit takes from Christ his victory against sin and his intimate relationship to the Father and gives all that to each baptized and charismated member of the church. I want to open the door just to answer questions. Let me just finish this and then I'm going to have you ask questions if you have because it's a, little, it's a little tough and if you don't understand what we've done up till now in the letter, I, won't, I, I wouldn't be able to go further. So in the same chapter, chapter 8, St. Paul moves from the gifts of the Son and the Spirit to the gift of persecution and suffering for Christ, concluding with the beautiful song, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. 
Uh, so the, the question here is, do we understand the, sick, the, the progression of the letter? It goes from the unrighteousness to the righteousness of God declared and that has to be believed. Then the gift of righteousness in Christ and the spirit, which is different by, between the Old Testament and New Testament. So can somebody tell me if you're up with me and you're paying attention, what's the difference between the, the Genesis 15.6 and Romans, uh, Romans six, and, and seven and eight, in the item of the righteousness of God. There's a difference between the Old Testament righteousness of God and the New Testament righteousness of God. Can we have somebody answer this? You can. You want. Uh, maybe I can try to answer Abuna. Yeah, go ahead. So in Genesis, God told Abraham that he's righteous, he's um, righteous, yes, but that's in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, I understood that we get the righteousness of God with baptism and, and the Holy Spirit with the Mayron. Excellent. So the righteousness of God in baptism is Jesus himself. Anybody has an, a, a verse about Jesus becoming righteousness, our righteousness? That's not in the book of Romans, but I think the Old Testament has already proclaimed this. <clears throat> it's very beautiful once you understand this. It's actually Jeremiah. Anybody know the verse I'm talking about? That the Lord himself. Let me show you. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. Behold, that's Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch called the Nazarene branch. And he will reign wisely as king and will administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. And this is Jeremiah. You just write it here. Jeremiah. I think it's 23. Let me get it from here. Do you know that verse, anybody? Um, twenty three six. That's how it goes. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. We, of course, we know who that is, and he will reign wisely as king, and will administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. The two kingdoms. To that Israel was not there in the time of Jeremiah. He speaks about the future. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Right? So um, this is, I think, what is this actually summarized? You can summarize it in this 23. We said 23, 6. 23, 6. So this is it. So what is our righteousness that God is declaring and also giving? It is Christ. And after Christ comes the Holy Spirit. So the righteousness in the Old Testament, like Ramon said, righteousness in the Old Testament is the declaration, spoken words. In the New Testament, it's a person. That person is given to us. Every time you come to church and take communion, you've taken righteousness of God. It is the kingdom of God and his righteousness in Christ. The Lord, our righteousness. Okay. Any question about this? So that unrighteousness that was, was happening between Gentiles and Jews, and nobody could do anything with it because of the law, could not do anything in us. Jesus came and lived in our hearts through baptism, and then the Holy Spirit lived in our bodies, and the Holy Spirit lived in our bodies as temple, and both the Spirit and the Son 
causes us to live righteously. Now we come to a very difficult place in the whole Old Testament. This is, might be the most difficult passages in the whole New Testament from beginning to end. St. Paul says, uh, what shall we say then? And this is chapters 9, 10, and 11. Let's start with the Calvin controversy. John Calvin, one of the reformers. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion whomever I will have compassion on. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor, another to dishonor? Okay, what does that mean? Calvin explained these verses as if God chose certain people to go to hell and certain others to go to heaven, and he called that a predestination. And they went on and talked about relative de de predestination and uh, an absolute predestination, and I, there's different predestinations. Temporal predestination, the internal predestination, all, all kinds of things. But the apostolic church, both Catholic and Orthodox, the two branches of orthodoxy, rejected this erroneous explanation. St. Paul here did not speak of individuals. He's not talking about certain people, certain persons. When he talks about uh, a choice, he doesn't speak about singles. He doesn't do that. When he talked about Jacob and Esau in the beginning of the chapter, he did not speak of them as individuals because they lived in blessing till they died. Both of them, Jacob and Esau, were blessed. They were actually blessed. But the prophecies were specific to their nations, Edom and Israel. What kind of blessing that Israel got that Edom didn't get? Remember how Edom was blessed, was actually uh, materially very blessed. Edom or Esau was rejected as a nation and Israel was accepted. Esau was the firstborn of Isaac and was the one to be blessed as the priestly family. Jacob was chosen as the priestly family instead of uh, Esau. So the people of God did not become uh, Edom, the Edomites, it became the Israelites. So that choice of God is about who would serve me as a priest not as rejected human being. No, that's not about rejecting anybody from God's plan. It's about who will do a certain work. In other words, the church and Christ, God chose us for heaven. And the church and Christ. And what does that mean? So they say, so God did not choose uh, John and not choose James, or he chose uh, Jack and not choose uh, Joe. He did not ch choose Lydia and rejected Anna. That's not at all what is meant here. But what is happening here, that there is a specific people that God had made the choice of, which is Israel. And there he actually made the decision about his son, one of them, to be the one in whom he would accept everybody. It's up to me as an individual to choose Christ and the church. Let me put you an example, give you an example. So for example, about this quote unquote predestination. So let's say um, an airliner, uh, a flight company who makes different, who has different planes in their, in their, uh, in their garage, um, in the hangars. And so let's say plane number one, plane number two, plane number three, the first plane number one is going to New York. The second one, they designated it to go to New York. And the plane number two is to go to California. And the plane number three will go to Florida. So it is predestined. The plane is predestined. There is a choice here. The company has made already a choice that these vehicles will go to different places. Certain place for every plane. Okay. Can I say, I want to ride the plane. Um, I want to ride the plane. Can I say I am predestined to go to California? No, I'm not predestined to go to California unless I make a choice of the plane that goes to California. So when God said the vehicle to heaven is the church in Christ, Christ will be the person in the church to lead the church to heaven. Then by me making a choice to be in Christ, I am predestined to heaven when I continue in that choice. So that is not a simple God choices of individuals. He already had predestined a vehicle 
a place, a person. And I still have my choice to choose the person. To go to heaven, I have to choose Christ. I have to choose the church. It's up to me as an individual to choose Christ and the church. Likewise, God chose the Israelites as a group to be brought out from Egypt into the promised land. It's up to each person to choose to go with them or to stay in Egypt. He didn't force anybody. There is no predestination here as it seems like it. There is a difference between in the Bible between how God deals with a group and how he deals with individuals. Individuals have three choices, limited, of course, but with the groups he predestines. God's choice is the church in Christ with the seven sacraments. Our choice is Christ in the church. And the Father chose me in Christ. That's why it is always in Christ. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He knows those who will love my son, I'm going to take them to heaven. And it's up to me to choose Christ. God the Father sees us through his son. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And the Psalms, it's written, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Kiss means to love the son. So uh, Christ is in our midst. Christ present every day on the altar. The confession with our mouths of Jesus Christ, like we say during the liturgy, amen, 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 your death, O Lord. We proclaim your holy resurrection ascension to the he into heavens. We confess. I say, and then has God cast away his people? Certainly not. So we make that choice when we make those declarations. Amen, amen, amen. That's what this means. I say then, that has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Um, he's saying that the question is, did God really give up on the Israelites? Or do you not know that what the scripture says of Elijah? Now, this is an interesting example he's saying. That's in chapter 10, I think. 9, 10, 11 is part of that. That's uh, 9. Nine. Okay. Elijah, why is he bringing Elijah? He says, Elijah now, he pleads with God against Israel, against the kingdom of the north. What did Elijah say to God? What did he say? He said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone, underline alone, alone, am left, and they seek my life. Even I, they want to kill me. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In this verse, St. Paul differentiates the political Israel, the, the, the kingdom, from the true Israel of God. The former is an identified state with a known locality. That means they have a land, they have a king, there is like a form, you can see it, you can write about it. But the other, the 7,000 knees are individuals scattered with no obvious designated place. Nobody knows their location. So what is St. Paul saying here? He's thinking about this very deep. He's saying, while Elijah's thinking of the state of Israel, the kingdom, God is thinking of the individuals, the group that is scattered all over Israel and maybe outside Israel. When God said to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed, this was first fulfilled in the people of Israel the 12 tribes when they fail to be blessing to be a blessing by obedience to god's covenant law god blessed the world by scattering them as a punishment but yet he blessed the world all over the world so what is this so god said i'm going to bless the whole world by you by your descendants they like it or not like it i'm going to bless the whole world with them because they carry your seed what does that mean so he said, if they were obedient, if the descendants, your descendants were obedient to my covenant, they will be working with me. We will work together. They will be priests and missionaries, and they will go willingly to save the world and tell them about the true, the one true God. But if they are disobedient and start worshiping other gods and be, become like the rest of the world, what I'm going to do, I'm going to still bless the world with them by scattering them. Their, their punishment, their discipline will be a blessing to the world. It's almost like when, uh, you know how I think about it, like a priest in the Eastern Orthodox, but in Egypt used to do it. When we come to the time of the Theophany and we bless the water, we have a blessing prayer of the water, the end, and they used to go to the Nile here to go to the Jordan Lake or the rivers, and we get the blessed water and pour it in the river and the lake. What does that do to the lake, the water, lake water and the river water? A little, a cup of water, 
of the blessed water will bless the whole lake. When I go to the house, I, I sprinkle a little bit of water in the whole house and it blesses the whole house. So those little people of Israel, by scattering them through the world, the whole world becomes blessed, even in their disobedient status, because they carry the blessing of God. They are a blessing, even in their disobedience. Sometimes you have to think about this on an individual level, when you are actually not obedient, but you're still a blessing to the world. So God's plan was to send Israel everywhere so that they, when he sends the gospel throughout the world, he would be bringing together Abraham's children. So as a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, Jesus is sent and he commissioned his disciples to go to the whole world. Their, their primary job is to bring the Israelites that were scattered. But when you bring those Israelites whom dissolved in the world, what happened? You're going to have to bless the whole world. You're gonna have to you gonna have to bring the whole world. So this is what I say in an example. So I give you a um, a cup or a bottle, a small bottle of blessed water, and I say, um, when I come to your house, please uh, keep that bottle of water because I wanna use it to bless the house. But then your mother doesn't know what this cup of water or the bottle of water looks like, or why is why is it set apart by itself, or you, even your older brother. He takes that bottle of water and put it in the big jug of water that you drink from in the fridge, in a bigger amount of water. So I come and say, where is my blessed bottle of water? And you say, Abuna, I'm sorry. It is now mixed with a bigger, bigger bottle of water. There's a lot of water here, like five gallons. I, I cannot take him out. It's already mixed with it. So guess what? And instead of taking that little bottle of water, I, I'm going to have to take what? the whole five gallons so when god sent his israel to the whole world and he wants to bring them back he's going to have to bring with them the whole world that's why saint paul said it so it gives an example of the lump and the dough the lump is a small piece of dough but the dough is the bigger bigger container of dough he said if you mix the lump with the dough the whole dough is holy you're gonna have to bring in to take with them the whole dough if the lump is holy, then the whole dough is holy. St. Paul clarifies and affirms the path of God and his plan to scatter them and to bring them, the Israelites, together to him along with the entire world. The gospel was a vision of Israel for salvation. But this harshness on Israel was because in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And thus Israel saved, meaning this is the way. When he said, by this way, all Israel, all Israel shall be saved. Uh, let me read it with you because you, I want you to understand what this means. This is important. That's chapter 11. All Israel shall be saved. And it's the translation. It doesn't say then. It says thus. And what's the difference? So let's go to Romans 11. I know it's a tough, it's a tough one, but we have to bear with it. I, uh, I'm almost done. So Romans 11. So it speaks about the scattering that happens in Elijah time. Um, here we go. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, he calls it, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until, until the fullness of, Gentile, of the Gentiles has come in. Come in means the gospel reach everywhere. And so, not when, not then. This is so is is in all translation. What does so means when you say so? Like this, in this manner. Thus, 
in Arabic, it's hakaza. In this manner. In this manner, all Israel will be saved. So what's he saying here? Sometimes we will take this to mean all Israel is a technical term. It, they say, oh, when the, when, when the fullness of Gentiles come, then the state of Israel will be converted to Christianity. Isn't, is this what St. Paul is saying? Absolutely not. What he's saying here, and that when the fullness of Gentiles come, all Israel then will be saved, meaning, so likewise, because they are scattered everywhere, when all Gentiles are coming in, kind of practically speaking, then all Israel, all Israel here means including all the tribes, because 10 tribes are scattered, nobody knows where they've gone. They dissolved in the Gentiles, nobody knows where they are. They're mixed up with the lump, with the dough. They're mixed up with a bigger belt, bottle of water. So to bring me that bottle of water that I asked from you, you're going to have to bring the whole five gallons. If you bring the whole five gallons, I know, I know that I have my bottle. You understand this? Is that, is that easy to understand? Not difficult? Difficult? So he's not saying here, when all the Gentiles have learned the gospel, then I will bring in Israel. No, by all the Gentiles coming to the gospel, all Israel, all the tribes will be represented. The fullness will be gathered. So that's what this is about. It's a difficult one, and that's why I wanted you to kind of read it with me. Um, and then he go, goes to really meditate on this and gets very, he's flabbergasted, he's blown out by this idea. Oh, the depth of the richness, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his way past, past finding out. St. Paul started praising God because he saw his plan to send Israel and the gospel to all the earth to bring Israel together along with the entire earth. And so, so all Israel be saved as it is written. So here, so here indicates the way, not the time of the salvation of all Israel. All Israel is a term that indicates all the tribes and not each individual. The New Testament prophecy uh, of Christ, this gospel will preach to all nations. Then the end will come is a fulfillment of the same promise to Abraham. So Jesus knows this. He says, when the gospel goes to all the nations, everybody hears about the gospel, then the end will come. We know that third countries are not really open yet. The last piece in this letter is living out the righteousness of God. The Christian life in the church and the world. That's chapter 12 to 16. So 9, 10, and 11 is about Israel. And he uses the olive tree idea. We didn't talk about it, but there he speaks of Israel as the original olive tree, the home grown olive tree in the house of God, that's Israel. But then the, the wild olive tree that is not brought up into the home is, is the Gentiles. So it says the branches of the homegrown olive tree were broken so that the branches of the wild tree come and be grafted into the trunk of the homegrown olive tree. It's saying you Gentiles are not the root, the Israelites are the root and God had broken some branches because they didn't believe and, and grafted you in their place. Don't be proud, he's saying to the Gentiles. Again, you see the same idea. There's two groups, and St. Paul is trying to talk to both of them to calm down and not to be proud one against the other. The last point is living out the righteousness of God. There are instructions. This is the practical part. Like I told you, in all the letters, there is theology, and there is praxis. Theologia and praxis. Praxis is practical. He starts in chapter 12 by this beautiful hymn about your liturgy, the liturgy that you pray in the church all the time. I love it because it's very deep and very to the point. And it echoes from the Psalms and the Old Testament a lot. He says, I beseech you, therefore, that's how he began chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <coughs> by the mercies of God, that you present, here present means offer. Present your bodies, offer your bodies. Bodies means sarcos, flesh, a living sacrifice. Let's go and read this in Greek so you, you kind of get a hint to what this might be. Um, so I'm going to write down Greek, Strong's, Romans, 12.1. Here we go. So he says, 
Um, if you read the English here, I exhort therefore you, brethren, through the compassions of God, to present the bodies. Look at this. Somata. Somata is the physical body. Of you, your bodies. Uh, that is Thithayan. Thithayan. This is a piece that you read, you sing in Kirk, which is Tinin. Uh, Thithayan, a sacrifice. Uh, and then the other one is Zuan. Zuan, living, sacrifice. Agiyan to Theo, holy to God. And then here is the thing. Reasonable, which is teen, logikin, logic, logical, logikin, reasonable. Latrian, latrian, service. Actually, when you click on latrian, it is this. What is latrian? Um, it's actually liturgical. That's what I wanted to. Okay, let's go to. So no, that three yen is two nine nine nine. So what does it mean here? Um, service ref ref render to God, perhaps simply worship, perhaps. But what does the other ones used as? Latrio renders sacred service, technical service. Latria technically priestly service occurs five times in the New Testament, which is related to the Levitical work in the Old Testament. Liturgical service. Latria means liturgical service. Basically, what St. Paul is saying in this, that you are offering God a living sacrifice. That's what we say it in the beginning of our liturgy. A mercy of peace, a sacrifice of praise. We say that and we say it in the beginning of the anaphora. So the liturgical worship. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, somaton, a living sacrifice, Sisian, holy, acceptable to God, which is your logicon, reasonable service, latrian. We sing this perfectly, exactly like I said it in Greek, entinein, enkia. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He's saying, get out of the thoughts of unrighteousness. Uh, yield to the work of the Spirit inside of you and yield to the example of Christ that inspires you, that you have put on during baptism. And do not yield to the sin which is trying to ensnare us. Example of a living sacrifice, if you want to talk about this, there is in Christ is the first one. Isaac and the three youth in the fiery furnace. That's why we think of them as we, we think about the... Uh, uh, the, that piece they were living sacrifice they offered themselves as living sacrifice so this is called liturgical worship logicon letrian in this imagery saint paul resembles the body of to isaac who was bound and placed on the altar and complete offering to god likewise our bodies in the liturgical prayers are bound we make the mind fix our bodies in standing Rifting, uplifting our hands, lifting our minds while our mind is in prayer to God. The second piece is talking about the seven charismatic gifts. We call them charismatic gifts of the spirit. And this is in Romans um, 12, 6 to 8. These are important to know because this is a place where St. Paul talks about the gifts. He speaks about the charismatic gifts in comparison to the uh, the individual gifts. Charismatic means service. The first one in the charismatic gifts is prophecy. Second is ministry. The third is teaching. The fourth is exhortation. The fifth is giving. The sixth is leadership. 
The seventh is mercy. These are given to each one of us. Some of us will have one, some of us will have two, some of us will have three. Very rarely, somebody would have four, but Christ have all seven. So what does prophecy mean? Rebuking, using the word of God, saying this is wrong. Declaring God's will towards certain group or actions. God is not happy with that. Ministry. What does ministry as a charismatic gift mean? Acts of service that usually does not include words. Um, helping to clean, helping to feed somebody, attending to the sick, attending to those in prison. Maybe it doesn't include any kind of sermon giving or teaching. Giving a, a ride. Teaching. It's the explanation of the word of God for understanding. People to understand what God means by the word that he's giving. Exhortation, words of encouragement to follow Christ. Giving of money or material goods. It doesn't include any words. So prophecy, teaching, exhortation are all about words. Ministry, giving, leadership, and mercy are not about words. Leadership, a gift that discerns the other gifts in the church and direct them to serve the church. So this is usually given to the priest or the hegumen or the bishop when they are in, in, a, in a, a higher place. They can actually ask, invite different people with the gifts. They can see it and they tell them to do it. Mercy giving. That's empathic listening. When a person listens with all their heart and sometimes cry with them. We can see it through the eyes of each of the gift carriers. So uh, what a prophet sees. Oh, oh, prophet cannot tolerate sin. Anything wrong? Be very, very aggressive with it. That's why St. Paul says prophecy concerning the faith. Sometimes the prophets have a tendency to criticize things that has nothing to do with faith. So he's saying be limited. So don't lose that gift. A prophet can make, uh, make and comment on the language, uh, mistakes in math, mistakes in uh, science, whatever. And he's saying you're going to lose the effect that you have by going and criticizing everything. Just always limit yourself to the things of faith so they can build people toward God. The minister is a servant, cannot tolerate a need for service. Somebody hungry, somebody tired, and they would go and help. The teacher cannot tolerate ignorance. The eyes of the teacher sees always where ignorance is and he wants to fill in the missing pieces of information. Sometimes the teachers can get carried out by showing off information which is not helping. The exhorter, the encourager, cannot tolerate sadness. They don't want to see somebody uh, down. Giver cannot tolerate poverty. The lack or the lack. The lack of anything. Materially. The leader cannot tolerate disorganization. He, he cannot tolerate solution chaos. This is something they cannot depair with. <coughs> they want things to be in order. The mercy giver cannot tolerate loneliness. Somebody who is suffering lonely. So uh, uh, this is the this is the uh, list of giving of the I'm sorry of the charismatic gifts. Romans chapter fifteen is when. When we then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. Scruples mean the, uh, the uncertainty, the doubts, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So look out for each other in instructing them how to treat one another in Romans 15. Chapter 16 instructs them to care for Phoebe. She was a deaconess, Aquila, and Priscilla. And that's how this letter ends. Um, that's it. If you have any questions on this letter, please let me know. Okay. All right. I know it's a, not an easy letter, but I think when you read through a little bit, um, maybe a couple of times, you can get um, the main street is strain or the main line of it. This is the most important letter of St. Paul. There's that very big idea uh, of what he's preaching, what he's talking about. And uh, the rest of the letters will tackle different problems. This one has one problem, should, should the eyes or idea, but 
it 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 led to the big picture of St. Paul's teaching. Next time we'll go and continue on with the letters of St. Paul. Let's say our Father, in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Make us worthy, O Lord, say thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses against us. Give us not the temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the pardon. Now and forever. May the love of God the Father and grace is only begotten Son Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you. Goodbye. Thank you, Abuna. Goodbye.